it's time to enter the kernel. When you start learning a new programming language, you usually start by doing hello world. Is this how we should start doing kernel programming? If we're starting to write a kernel, how hard is it to write a program like printing hello world? What are all the things this actually relies on that you're not seeing? Yes. It certainly relies on some library code being able to take a string and, and print it out. What else does it rely on? Yes. OK, so it relies on something being able to put things on the display. That's involving an awful lot of complexity. Right? So to actually have something like print hello world work, well, we've got the library code for dealing with strings, and that's not too bad, maybe. But we've also got a system call to actually do anything that affects the outside world, like what's displayed on a terminal. We need a system call for that. That's going to go to the operating system. We need an operating system that can connect to the display and print a character. So this is a really, really complex program. This may be an easy program when students see it in CS1110 as their first Java program, although I guess it probably still has a lot more cruft than this. But if it's your first Python program or something, it's a one-line program, it seems pretty obvious. You tell the computer to print something, and it does. Once we get to the level of the kernel, you're writing programs starting with nothing. To get to the point where you can actually print something out is a huge achievement. One of the things you have to do as you adjust to being a kernel programmer is realize that you're going to face a lot of frustration trying to do really simple, small things. But if you can you know, get the system to crash or hang, that's usually a major achievement. Getting from a hang to a crash is like the biggest step in kernel development. And then you know, once you can get the system to crash, you've made a huge amount of progress. And then you can probably you know, maybe get a character display or something like that. But the first thing you have to do to adjust to doing kernel-level programming is lower your expectations about how easy it is to do anything. I don't know if I said that the right way. You have to revel in very small achievements, because everything is going to be much harder than you expect. Let's get back to one of the questions from the exam, was what's the difference between a programming language and an operating system? This example sort of touches on that. This looks like a programming language. And when people learn a programming language, they're thinking all these things are provided by the programming language. Without an operating system, you couldn't actually do anything interesting with a program. Which came first, programming languages or operating systems? Is this kind of a chicken and egg type problem? Actually, let's, let's go back to the chicken and egg type problem. Which came first between the chicken and the egg? The egg. So there were tons of eggs before there were chickens. There were dinosaur eggs. There were lots of eggs. Eventually, evolution happened, and something became sort of like a chicken egg, and a chicken came out of it. Eggs went back long before chickens. And the question with programming languages and operating systems is sort of the same. They're both initially quite different things. When we say programming language, we have to be a little careful what we mean. So the language itself, that's an intellectual abstraction that isn't something that you can run. It's not a compiler. It's just I've defined this set of strings and rules for what they mean. That's what a language is. So if you looked at a language that way, programming languages certainly happened long before operating systems. The things that were at least what I would consider the first real general purpose precise programming languages were the language that Turing used and the paper that introduced the Turing machine in the 1930s. And around the same time, Alonzo Church had a language, Lambda Calculus, that's a string replacement language that was also a Turing complete programming language. So those two happened around the same time. You could argue even more that the language that Ada was using to describe programs for the hypothesized Babbage machine was also a programming language. There was certainly not an operating system, at least anything close to what we're calling an operating system in this class, around for them to run on. There wasn't even a computer. Then there were things that we think more like programming languages today that did actually have compilers and generate code that ran on machines. Did those depend on operating systems, the earliest programming languages? So at least if our, our definition of an operating system is something that manages resources, that limits what different programs can do with your machine, they certainly didn't. All of these early languages were running with complete control over the machine. The early operating systems, they weren't written in programming languages. They were written in assembly code. The earliest ones might have even been written before having assemblers, depending on where you define what makes something start to be an operating system. So they're really very different things. They're very related in the sense that they're both aiming to provide abstractions. Programming language is, first and foremost, something for humans to use to try to think about programs. The programming language by itself doesn't mean the compiler and all the other tools that evolve around it. In terms of programming languages people actually use, those are really what people are often talking about. Whereas the operating system itself, well, that is a program that runs on some hardware. It could be real physical hardware, or it could be some simulated hardware. The kinds of abstractions they provide 
Well, they're really sort of similar. They, they're providing abstractions, but at different levels and in different ways. And they're providing abstractions with different kinds of resources. The main abstraction the programming language is providing is an abstraction to memory, whether it's in a register or in RAM or in swapped out to disk. It's giving you some nice abstraction where you can use variables to interact with that memory. And then there, there are other things that the programming languages give, mostly through libraries in terms of ways of interacting with resources like files and the network and the display. Whereas the OS is more giving you abstractions to resources while it includes memory, but it doesn't give you much of an abstraction to memory. It's allocating memory to programs, and then if you're writing at a high level, you have an abstraction how to use that memory. But it's giving you abstractions to other resources. But it's really focused on, on this managing sharing. People can write operating systems in high-level languages, but only if that language doesn't already depend on an operating system. So that's where we get into trouble if we try to write an operating system in a high-level language. If the language depends on already having an operating system, any operating system you write in it can only be run on top of that original one. You're never going to get down to an operating system that runs on the bare metal if you need all that. The fact that you can write this program in Rust and it works would make you think that you couldn't write an operating system in Rust. If there weren't any way to make Rust behave so you couldn't write this program and have it work, then you would be pretty convinced that Rust depends on having some complex system that allows you to do all these things already, and there's no way to build from scratch. You're already always depending on all these other programs to write a Rust program. The good news is you can get rid of all that. And the way to get rid of all that is this. If you include this no standard directive at the beginning of your Rust crate, that means don't rely on any of these other programs or anything that depends on them. Now you're getting just what you can get from the Rust compiler and not relying on anything else. So now what we've done that, what should happen when we try to compile this program, our old Hello World program? Seeing lots of frowns. Yeah, we should get an error. Printlin does not exist. There is no Printlin defined. And it better not exist, or at least it better not exist and do anything like print out things on our terminal, because that totally depends on having a lot of other things in place. If we're gonna build an operating system kernel ourselves, better not already be in place. We better set our expectations lower. We're probably not going to get to do something as complicated as printing a hello world anytime soon. Let's get rid of printing. And printing's for the week. Only people who want to write user level programs should care about printing. We've got rid of printing. Now we're just doing things that manipulate memory. What do we think the Rust compiler is going to do with this code? Is there anything that depends on an operating system in this code? Yes. OK, so allocating memory. So certainly getting memory for a process to run depends on something. It doesn't necessarily mean you have a lot of operating system overhead to, to have that. So certainly to be able to run this program, you need some way to load this code into memory and start running it. So you needed that to get it started running. That doesn't mean, mean that the code itself is relying on anything other than something else that got it to start running. So that's a good point, that to run any program, we need something that can load some code into memory and set the program counter to start running that code. When the processor is powered up, it's going to look for code at some location and start running it. So what we really need is just a way to put code at that location. What else does this depend on? So remember what we talked about earlier. And this is very like, I, I think this is exactly the same example we showed you earlier, where when you ran this code, you got a runtime error because software-based memory isolation protection. What do we think should happen if we ran this code without an operating system? So if it was C code, it would be OK. Right? If we didn't have software-based memory protection the way Rust does, it would run, it would modify some strange location in memory, and probably everything would be fine. But the Rust language doesn't allow that. The Rust language, having memory safety is a property of the language. What should happen when we run this code, we need to get a, a memory error for that. One little thing I forgot about before we compile it. So main is also for the weak. There's no predefined where things start. We need a directive to say where you start. So we've added that. But otherwise, it's the same code. Now when we compile it, we still get another error. Since we changed it, to this new main type, that's supposed to return a value. That's just the convention, main returns an integer, so we've got to change it to have that return. And now when we compile it, remember what we saw when we compiled before? We got this code, which includes this call that happens when it executes and when the bounce check fails. So what should happen if we don't have an operating system with that call? If we don't have the standard library? That call does not exist. That's exactly what happens. So the REST compiler, when it gets to this line, it doesn't know that that's going to fail. It's not figuring out that this is out of bounds, but anytime it's generating code for 
an array access that could be out of bounds. It needs to generate that code that depends on the fail bounce check. So we've got to provide that. Right? That's not built in. Once we've got rid of all the standard library and the standard one, well, we can't use it because that depends on an operating system. That depends on being able to print out that nice error message. So we're going to need to provide our own. We've defined our fail bounce check code. And all it does is call abort. Abort is coming from this intrinsic built-in that just aborts. So there is something that now we're getting from outside, but it's something very simple that's built into this REST intrinsic. The other thing that we need, any code that runs that does a function call, which main does, could exhaust the stack. And when that happens, we also need a runtime error. So we need some code that happens. When that happens, it's also going to do an abort. So now we've got it. It compiles fine, and we run it, and this is great. It runs, and we get an illegal instruction. So you should be very happy. You're making a lot of progress in kernel-level programming. If you actually looked at the stack trace when it ran, it's making a legal instruction in the abort. So it did get to the abort. It got the memory out of bounds. If you ran it without that, and I think I do have it, yeah. So if we changed I to 2 and ran it, it actually runs and finishes. This is maybe even better to be able to run your program without it crashing, although sometimes that's worse because you don't know what's going on if it doesn't crash. But if you want it to finish, that's actually good. 